Second segment, this one is called the Seuss Bocan. These cars are the oldest ones we have at the museum. They were first built in 1906, put into service in 1907, and they ran for a nice seven years, and then were taken offline in 1914. These cars went from Minneapolis to Spokane, but instead of going just through the states, they would come up across the Canadian border up into Canada, where many of these cars would be serviced and the crews would be swapped off. These cars were owned by CP Rail, and they managed to cut a lot of time off rail travel by coming up into Canada, since there was less intersecting railways up here than there were down in the States. And this in turn angered the American rail companies, as at one point they were losing business to the Sioux Spokane. They had to decrease their prices in order to compete. The one thing that makes these three cars we're going to see very special and quite unique is that they're completely made out of wood, the wooden framework you can see here. These wooden cars were taken offline in 1914 for one reason. They were just becoming too dangerous to be kept in service, as around this time, metal cars were becoming more and more popular. And then if a wooden car were to get into a collision, because there was no supporting frame on the sides, the car would be completely crushed inwards, kind of like a telescope. And obviously you don't want that happening to your passengers, so the best idea was to take it offline. Once they were offline, many of the cars were actually burned or destroyed, making wooden cars, wooden cars very hard to come by today. Unfortunately, the chairs inside this car are not the original. As like I said, the original chairs were actually stripped out by the family so they could make room for their furniture. But the ones we replaced here at the museum are the right type for the car. These are what we call roll-over back seats. And as the name sounds, the back of the chair actually rolls over, allowing four people to sit across from each other. This was also very convenient as back in the day when the cars reached their terminal station, they no longer had to flip the entire carriage around, they could just roll the seats the other way and go. So since the car was built a little bit earlier than the Seuss Bocan cars, we'll notice some small differences. This one here is actually built in 1901, so it's the oldest one we have. You can see up top, this car actually has original gas light fixtures rather than the electrical ones. These lights burn a coal-based gas called pinch gas. Don't ask me, I don't know whose idea it was to put fire and wood together, but <laughs> you know what, that's all they had back in the day. You can see this car also has a decorative wooden trim along the sides, as well as its original beveled glass windows and etched glass vents. So those are original up there? Yes, all the glasswork and the woodwork is original in here. Except for these two wall segments, because once again this was cut up by the family to make some small uh, renovations. On one side they actually added a fireplace, and then on the other was a, was a front entrance. So it's kind of like a cozy little living room. So the seating section inside the Omimi is unfortunately also not restored as to the point that we want it to be. You can see however many of the original chairs are set in the side just so we can put them back later on. But this car here was originally built in 1906 by the Barney and Smith Company of Dayton, Ohio according to Canadian Pacific's specific demands. And actually inside this car you can see the building company placed their trademark, which happens to be the two palace glass half domes located on either side of the car, each containing 1,250 pieces of leaded glass. The inlay designs on board the Omimi are actually quite uh, an art piece as they are supposed to look very wild. Meant to des designed to look like plants and vines growing all throughout the car. You can see they're even on the side of the chairs there, and the chairs even have a foliage green to match them. Like I said, unfortunately the chairs were stripped out by the family as they wanted to make room for their furniture. But the good part here is they actually kept the original chairs. These seats, you can have a feel if you like, they're upholstered with a very velvety material called green mohair. It's very soft. This is actually a special type of goat hair. And one particular yard of this green mohair today would cost almost $500. So if we actually wanted to restore all the chairs in the car, it cost us almost $30,000. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's just for the upholstery. Mm -hmm. Up front by me here, you can also take a look at the poster board. This shows you how the Omimi looked when we first found it as a country cottage uh, once it was discovered outside of Wisconsin. You can see the family did some small renovations on the outside, but they kept the interior exactly as we see it. Further in, you can take a peek at what a seat looks like set up, as this is the only two we have at the moment, and you can see the skeletal structures of the upper bunk. I just ask you, don't touch this as you come on by. In fact, if you ask me, I like the ones here a little bit more than the trans Canada. <laughs> you can see it's the same thing though, there's, all the, there's still the skeletal structures. Uh, back in the day there still was a uh, mattress inside there, as well as the mm -hmm. railing and the actual curtains. 
up front, you can take a look on this poster board mm -hmm. at the pictures, uh, how, how we actually restored and moved the cars. Because this car and the next we're going to see are actually official members of the Suze lineup. These guys are actually quite historically important, as they were important in bringing uh, citizens across Canada in the early years. And because of this, the Canadian government has actually given the, this car and the next the title of Canadian Cultural Property. That is, that is the highest rank any artifact item can receive in Canada, and it makes these two cars priceless in a sense. In fact, yeah. it took the Canadian government almost $1 million just to transport this car and the next into Cranbrook. Whoa, we. I know. Just like the one inside the River Rouge, this was a place for all passengers to come on in and they can enjoy the scenic view as they traveled across the countryside. Uh, there was no designation, so men, women, children, the elderly were all allowed to come on in and enjoy this area. What's really interesting here is that these seats are all the original wicker from 1907. So they were actually back in passenger service. And in fact, what's even more amazingly, the family on board the Curzon actually kept such good care of the car. Even the carpets underneath the chairs, the black wool you see there, is also the original from when it was in passenger service. Yeah, wool carpets really do last. Mm -hmm. windows were just awesome. Oh, yes. My word. The original ones from back in this day. Yeah, what a difference from the modern, huh? Oh, yes. They, back then, it seems like they took a, a, they had a more, I don't know what you want to call it. You know, like nowadays, everything is just built, right? Yes, that's right. They, they actually and put a bit more, like, I want to say even almost passion into it, but that's... Yeah. This car was actually an accidental find. It was accidentally discovered while Gary Anderson was looking for the Omimi. But it turns out that these two cars were both taken offline in Wisconsin and put in the same trailer park owned by different families. Wow. But if you went to the lawn of one car, you could actually see the other from a distance away. <laughs> yeah, so like I said, accidental find. But you can see it took a little bit of getting used to because at first it didn't look like a train car at all. Are you mm -hmm. not kidding? Mm -hmm. Here are actually of the high-end business and royal class. And then afterwards we're going to jump off into worker and commuter coach. The first car we're currently in here is the high, is the very high-end business car, the British Columbia. It was first built in 1928 as uh, a private car. These cars were built and named after the provinces of Canada, and they were owned by the C executives of the CP Rail Company. That means regular passengers couldn't actually purchase a ticket on board. You had to be invited, so you had to have very good connections. In this car, though, the passengers had tremendous power and actually full control of the entire carriage. They could actually boss around the conductors and the drivers, <laughs> telling them what to do. As you can see in the sitting room here, you can tell how fast the train was moving and whether or not the brakes were applied. So actually, you get a precise idea of exactly how fast you were going down the tracks. And if it made you feel unsafe or if you, it was going too fast for your taste, you could actually pick up this phone underneath the table and call up to the conductor, letting him know to speed up, slow down, or stop the car altogether. So this was just like a taxi on Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Private jet I compare it to usually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this car is actually quite a miracle as it was untouched for all the years that it was in service. So all the way up until, uh, from 1928 all the way up until 1981 when it officially came offline, the car still remains untouched. All the varnish you can see is still originally how it would have been, uh, covering all of the original pa wood panels. The lights in the car actually still run on their original 32 volt systems as well. We have to get specially designed light bulbs for them. That includes the two large items up top. Those are called chandeliers. It is a fan plus a chandelier. How creative of a name. I didn't make that up. That's actually what CP Rail called them back in the day. The fan spins one way and it causes the grill to spin the opposite and spreads air evenly all throughout the room. It's very good at getting rid of the hot heat on those uh, hot summer days. I actually can show you what I mean as these guys still turn on after all. Wow. Uh -huh. Good. So we fold up into the wall, chair, and uh, then it folds up, toilet. Oh, no use. To goodness. <laughs> that is really. Oh, yeah. That is something else. Uh huh. I know. Yeah, I right? saw the uh, sinks of the chef, whose room we'll see in a moment. Mm -hmm. But on the table is a, muse uh, is a collection of the museum tablecloth where, unfortunately, the china is not the original. The only so uh, original pieces are the salad dishes as well as the teapots and the creamers there. Mm -hmm. Those are our original pieces of CP silver. Many of the other original pieces are kept in the china cabinet up front here just for safekeeping as we, and uh, to make sure they don't further tarnish. As let's be honest, nobody wants to polish all that silver. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> but inside this car, the cool part is, if you look up above the cabinet now, 
that little box. That was actually a small radio built into this car in 1928. Yeah. Uh, and that, it was for the diners to come on and listen. To, uh, they could listen to their favorite mealtime songs while they ate. But you know as Canadians, how we love our hockey. Back in the day, the radio was set on one channel. Hockey Night in Canada. <laughs> you could all foster Hewitt. <laughs> Inside this room, you can see on the walls here are also the white doorbells called Porter's Bells, and that was all connected to a system up front in the kitchen. But there also was a little secret hidden. If you flip up this corner and that far corner of the tablecloth, but the next car we're going to head into is not as pretty as the one we just saw. I apologize, a little bit of an eyesore. But this car is the 1930 Grand Prix. When it was first built, it was a business class sleeper. There was a hallway down the entire length and a washroom on each side. There were 14 private business compartments on the opposite walls here. But, similar to the cars in the Trans Canada, in the 1950s, after the Great Depression, this car was downgraded to a freight car. That's what we see here. Mm -hmm. Having all of the original wooding gutted out by chainsaw. So, so remember the River Rouge, that really gorgeous car at the end of the Trans Canada? When we first found it, it looked like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And since everything was done really barbarically in this car, some of the segments have been left in the walls and it shows us how big the rooms once were. We could tell the rooms were about 6 by 8 feet and the only thing they came with was a small bed underneath the window, a mirror on the side, and a sink underneath. These rooms didn't have to be very big or spacious as they were mostly being used by single businessmen on daily night trips. And in the middle of the car, you can see here is the last original separating wall in the entire car. This actually helps a lot, once again, with restoration, as it tells us that at one point, this entire car was furnished with a black walnut finish. You can also see the inlay designs on the sides. Mm -hmm. And after that, you can come behind the wall. You can see that everything from that point down was gutted up by door level instead of having the entire ceiling removed. Oh, excuse me. But that helps a lot with future restoration once again as it shows us exactly where the lights and the vents stood. Yeah. Now since we're this far into the car now, you might be asking yourself, why is this car placed in our high-end business and royal class? Well, it doesn't look like much, I know. But back in its heyday, actually in 1939, this car was a royal car for a short time as it actually carried King George VI on his royal visit across Canada. He actually converted the last three compartments, or the grey area here, into his own private office, library, and dressing room. This was Carrie and his royal selection. So if you can imagine the king just sitting on his throne over here, <laughs> <laughs> relaxing. <laughs> Alright, we have you can take a look at these wood panels. They are restored black walnuts. Uh, but this is not from this car, these are from the Argyle Dining Car in the Trans Canada, but it's the same type of wooding and the exact same that would have been inside the car. And once we're done there, we're going to actually leave the Grand Prix and go into the last car on the lineup, which is actually my favorite here, because it is CP's private royal car. It's called the Strathcona. It's an executive night car. You can come on in, take a look. The first room we're going to pass right by here is the small porter's lounge. You can see that this is the only room that's not officially royal as the chairs are still in Pullman style. Whoa. You can see there's also a small wash bar for the workers to sort of relax and clean up in. So, coming down the hall here, we're actually going to take a look at the Strathcona's five private royal sleeping compartments. Uh, you'll see in a second why these rooms are considered royal. Because they all have their own beds and furniture with their own matching pattern. It's kind of cute. The first two rooms down the Strathcona are actually uh, paired and shared, sharing a small bathroom and shower. The next two rooms down the hall are paired and share a small bathroom plus bathtub. And then the last room at the far end of the hall, just before we enter the sitting room there, it's a master bedroom that has its own private ensuite once again, and its own private bathtub. You guys can come on in, take your time exploring any of these five rooms, and when you're ready, I'll meet you at the far end of the hall in the sitting room where we can take a seat and finish off. Oh, wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Awesome, huh? Yes. As the main job of the caboose was to survey the surrounding area and ensure the train line ahead was running uh, accident free. And in the case something was about to go wrong, the conductor sitting at the top of the decks here would be the first to know and it was their job to signal to the driver up front using flags or flashing lights. Mm -hmm. okay. After that though we can come into through the doorway and enter these living quarters of the caboose. The taller folks managed to duck down a little bit because <laughs> there's a lot of overhang. Yeah. But you can see this area is the home away from home for the workers on board going wherever they were across the country. It has all the necessities you could possibly need. We have the original stove on the side with your water sinks and wash basins, as well as the tables, benches, and the beds on board. In fact, we have a really interesting item on the table. You can take a look inside if you like. I just let you know, touch it. It is actually an original CPR conductor's uniform. It's what the gentleman wore on the with caboose before he had to put on his heavy work overalls. His wife actually donated his set to us after he passed away. But you can see all the nice, shiny shoes that I had to keep. <laughs> At first glance, upon entering the living quarters of the caboose, it might look pretty cozy, maybe something you want to stay on for a little bit, but I just warn you, appearances can be deceiving, as the caboose was one of the most dangerous places to be on in the entire train line. Because generally, all the way up until either the 60s or the 70s, the caboose, such as this one, was all made out of wood. The 60s was kind of when the metal ones actually came mm -hmm. into service. And while well, the wooden framework had two big flaws. The first one was it offered no insulation, so the caboose was either super cold or super hot. Exactly, there was no in-between unless you were during the fall season. Uh, but that means hypothermia was very common and so was heat stroke. The second flaw that the wooden framework offered is that it was extremely light and it made the caboose rattle around the most as it went down the track. Sometimes the derailments were also very common. In fact, depending on the size of your locomotive, sometimes the caboose could launch a foot into the sky when the train line starts, because all that slack in the couplings would suddenly tense up. And yet, like I said, that kinetic energy is pretty big. That's why uh, some of the workers on the caboose actually has to grab hold of something sturdy while the train uh, started, so they wouldn't get thrown around. And further in, we're going to come into the seating area. You can see a career coach. The reason this car might look slightly familiar is because, well, this Redverse was actually built originally in 1929 for the Trans Canada, but then in the 1950s, it was heavily downgraded into the car we see today. In fact, this car is the sister car to our brother Glen, which is what you saw in the Trans Canada. Mm -hmm. And actually, they are the exact same on the inside, but you can see in this one, it's left unrestored in its battleship mode, as I call it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that means all of that beautiful wood panel you guys saw is actually underneath this heavy layer of paint here. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You can see in some places where it's chipping off, you can see the wood underneath. But you can see it kind of reminds me of an yeah. army barrack after uh, the kind of car was downgraded. Mm -hmm. but it was still for passengers, two to a buck. Hmm. Afterwards, though, we're going to come down the hallway this way, and we're going to come take a look at the three private rooms on board. There's a well, private suite or so you can kind of see what that looks like. Kind of just a stark contrast between the first class yeah. and the yeah. commuter coach. Yeah. 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 You can see the private compartments here also have a connecting door between them, so you mm -hmm. can rent out one or both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once you guys are done taking a look, I'll get you to just follow me down the hall, please. Once he's done in that room, we're going to head out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> so, on our way out, we're going to pass by now is the women's lounge and dressing room. This is once again in the 50s style, but you can see the similarities between this one and the one in the Trans Canada. Yeah. Oopsie. <laughs> no worries. 
Just watch yourself inside, yeah? Actually, quite historically significant, as they are, uh, as they are the ones that pulled the Canadian. That's that nice silver train line on her maiden voyage. We have a auxiliary power unit B and a main driving cab unit A. Both have a 16-cylinder engine capable of 3,000 horsepower, so it has a total of 6,000 horsepower. You can see that they replaced the boring, monotone, pastel colors of the 50s and replaced it here with the vibrant, psychedelic colors of the 70s in an attempt to attract younger, more adventurous customers <laughs> to train travel. As they were actually losing business now to the airline, they were becoming more and more affordable and more popular. Uh, it was kind of a success. They got a little bit of people to come back. <laughs> but the first area we're currently in here is the bar. This was for older, more mature customers to come by. They can get an alcoholic beverage with their meal. So since we're here right now, I'm going to have to see some ID. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you guys to follow me, please. We're going to come down the hallway here. As long as, you, as long as you have some 1970s scotch. Yes, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, speaking of the alcoholic beverage, this car is actually quite new in my consideration as it didn't officially go offline until 1993. That's when its last posted liquor license was, and that's how we know. In fact, over here you can still see the original 1993 Via Rail menu offered on the takeout counter here. The prices may look pretty affordable for today's standards, but back in the day that was a lot of money. We can see that right on the side. Mm -hmm. Look at all the things you could, all, you could purchase. Please ask your attendant for details. Uh -huh. Yeah, when you think about the time, that is. Oh, yes. Yeah, it looks pretty affordable today, and then you think back, and it's like, that's a lot of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. But after we're done with that, you can come on in and take a look at the coffee bar, as well as the family diner that we entered upon. As, oh, sorry. As silly as the, this car looks with its colors from the 70s, it's actually quite important in Canada's history as it marks two significant changes that we just cannot talk about while we're inside. The first big change that occurred in the 1970s was because of Trudeau number one, we became bilingual and we adopted French as a second official language. You can see yeah, all the signs. Yeah, I with the signs. Exactly. All the signs are now in both French and English instead of English alone. The servers that actually worked on board the cafe lounge had to wear a special name tag which indicated to the customer which language they spoke. If they spoke both, they were paid and tipped more, so kind of a small bonus. Mm -hmm. The second big thing that happened in Canada, actually not just Canada, in all of North America in the 1970s was that everyone finally began to realize smoking was bad for your health <laughs> before they thought it had medicinal purposes. So once again, to cater towards the younger generation now that was sloughing away from the smoking fad, Via Rail gracefully divided up the smoking sections. You can see on one side of the diner you could smoke, on the other you couldn't. With no division in between. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Pretty funny if you ask me if you can see smoking on this side, mm -hmm. not on that one. Yeah. But that's, that's how it was. That's how it was, exactly. Yeah. 